Thanks to Theodora, the vulnerable Justinian hadn't been assassinated or supplanted, and he still had an empire to wake up to. But some of his enemies had kept busy during his long sleep. The plague had left a permanent scar on the Byzantine Empire. Nearly a quarter of its citizens lay dead. Crops had failed, trade had ground to a halt, and imperial revenue simply hadn't come in. The short-term consequences of this were apparent to anybody who saw the mass graves, but the long-term effects ran still deeper. In Italy, the Gothic tribes had rebelled. Having felt cheated by Belisarius' betrayal and unhappy with Roman rule, the tribes seized the opportunity to rearm and prepare for war, as plague gripped and weakened the hobbled empire. The signs had been obvious, and yet the Byzantines had done nothing. The Gothic leadership had even squabbled and fought, leaving them vulnerable and weak, and yet the Byzantines had done nothing. Why? Because they had been even more divided. The attention of imperial court had been entirely on the east, first on the Persians and then on the plague, and so there'd been little direct oversight of Italy. Meanwhile, the question of overall command had never been settled, and so instead, dozens of Byzantine commanders operated quasi-independently across the Italian peninsula. This all meant that when the Goths had finally settled their differences and come together under a man named Totila, Italy was ripe for the conquest. As the Gothic forces swept south, the towns, which were under-garrisoned and frustrated by high Byzantine taxes, threw open their doors. And when the Romans tried to retaliate, it only ended in disaster. In one famous attempt, the Byzantine forces had actually got someone to betray one of the Ostrogothic strongholds at Verona, and while a force of a hundred men snuck inside and threw open the gates, the eleven commanders of the Byzantine army assembled outside bickered about how to split the loot from the town, and so caught up were they in this argument that no one ever actually ordered their army to go through the now open gates. Before the commanders were done infighting, the Ostrogoths had re-seized the gate, and the Roman force trapped inside had to leap over the city wall in an attempt to escape. Shortly after that, a Roman force of 12,000 was scattered by 5,000 men under Totila, and Italy became theirs for the taking. Save for a few major cities and a few well-fortified coastal towns, all of Italy, all of Belisarius's hard-won conquests, fell to the Gothic forces. Even Naples, with its strong walls, couldn't stand against the Ostrogothic king. Twice the Romans tried to resupply it from Sicily, but twice they failed. Once by having their fleet scattered by the fleet of Totila, and once by nature herself when the wind turned against them. And when Naples, isolated and starving, at last handed over the keys to the city, Justinian knew it was time. He needed to get Belisarius back in the fight. But the empire was already strained to its limits. Justinian made Belisarius underwrite the cost of the war, sending him off essentially without an army to collect conscripts along the way. But through all of Thrace and Illyricum, Belisarius could only raise 4,000 men. And when he got to Italy, he found the situation to be even worse. There were very few Roman soldiers there, and they'd already gone for years without pay. Morale was at rock bottom, and every day more of them deserted to go join the Ostrogoths. Belisarius had to start all over again, from the very boot of Italy. He secured a few towns and established a presence in a few ports, but soon he found himself out of resources. He had neither the men, nor the arms, nor the supplies he needed. And at the same time, many of those that he'd recruited along the road to Italy got word of the fact that barbarian tribes had invaded their homeland and deserted to defend their own families and farms. And while Belisarius had a few successes and would on occasion even best Totila in the field, he could never capitalize on those successes enough to move the war forward. Plagued by insubordination and low morale, he couldn't even defend Rome, the city he had spent so much of his life trying to bring back into the empire, the goal that had personally cost him so much. The Byzantine Empire just couldn't support the war in Italy any longer. The ravages of the barbarians, the assaults of Cosro, the utter devastation of the plague, all of these had sapped the empire of its vitality, of its strength. Its reserves had all been spent on monumental buildings and grand campaigns, and when these waves of tragedy had hit, there was simply nothing left to fall back on. And so, though Belisarius was able to briefly reoccupy Rome, he was soon recalled to defend Constantinople, never to reunite Italy, and never to campaign again. And Rome, that city that was to be his and Justinian's legacy, fell again to the Ostrogoths not long after he departed. Meanwhile, rebellion had flared up in Africa, and the same old story of lack of pay, disunity of command, and plague spreading through the army kept the rebellion alive for years. Fortunately, this rebellion was eventually successfully quelled the same year Belisarius withdrew from Italy, a much-needed victory amidst so many losses. It had cost more time and money than it ever should have, but at least it would not go the way of Italy. Then, in 548, 
Theodora died of cancer. Justinian wept at her casket, the indomitable emperor in tears for all to see. He would not marry again, even though he lacked an heir. He chose to name his nephew-in-law as his successor, rather than betray her memory. But even as she had neared her death, the entire time he never forgot his empire. After so many failures and setbacks, many others would have just sunk into dejection and let the empire rot, but never Justinian. Say what you will about him, but Justinian never once abandoned what he thought to be his duty. He worked to slowly put the pieces back together with the same tireless spirit he had applied in the glorious days after the Nika revolts, but perhaps without the same joy. He continued the war in Lazica, but prevented the conflict from turning into an all-out war between the Byzantines and the Persians. He tried to reorganize the defenses to put up some resistance to the ever-mounting barbarian raids from the north. He began to get the Byzantine economy moving again, and though it was often complained about, he re-established a system of taxation to slowly fill the imperial treasury, and to pay for all the armies he needed to protect an empire assailed on all sides. And though the weight of the world could be seen on him after Theodora's death, though he had perhaps lost some of the fire he once possessed, and no longer found as much joy in his old passions, he did undertake one last great project. A project that had been most dear to Theodora. It would perhaps be the greatest he ever embarked on, and it would perhaps be his greatest failure. One last time, Justinian attempted to heal the split in the church that had plagued his empire. A split that would do more damage to the empire than barbarian raids or Persian kings, one which would last for centuries. If we talk more about Byzantium in future series, this split is gonna keep coming up. Now, when most of us think about splits in Christianity, we usually think about the split between Protestant and Catholic, but this divide was just as bitter and ran just as deep. This was the divide between the Monophysites and the Orthodox. It was a problem that Justinian had studied for years. Theodora had been Monophysite. He himself was Orthodox. Their reign was supposed to be a symbol of unity, and yet the divide had persisted. He had many times tried to find solutions, but nothing had ever stuck. But he had one final grand idea. The church was split concerning a complex theological question over the singular or dual nature of Christ, but in practicality it really came down to whether one accepted or refused the decisions of the Council of Chalcedon, where the dual nature of Christ had become orthodoxy. Justinian thought that he'd found a clever solution in the fact that the three strongest voices supporting that dual nature view also came from the now-considered heretical Nestorian branch of Christianity. So, if he could just get everybody to condemn those guys, they could serve as scapegoats for the problem. Monophysites could accept Chalcedon, and everybody could move on. He had made this proclamation in the year 543 while Theodora was still alive, but he would fight to get the leaders of the church to sign on for the rest of his life. He worked to see that the Pope, who was staying with him during a period where he was exiled from Rome because it was in Ostrogothic hands, endorsed his view. The Pope eventually gave in and agreed, though with great reluctance because he knew exactly what it would mean to his followers in Italy. He knew what would eventually prove true. This would not heal the schism in the East. Rather, it would simply end up creating a schism in the West. And so Italy has fallen. Theodora is gone, and the great project that their union was supposed to symbolize, the healing of the faith of the Empire, lies in tatters. But slowly, Justinian is rebuilding. He's not done yet. So join us next time as we conclude the reign of Justinian.